Well, folks, in today's video, I'm going to be showing you all what to do with an HO scale locomotive which has been sitting in storage for a while. So I'm sure some of you out there have encountered this where you have a locomotive which has maybe been sitting in an attic or a basement for maybe 20, 30, 40 plus years and you put it on the track and it doesn't go. And assuming the locomotive was working before being put into storage, your chances of getting it going again are very, very good. But even though the locomotive hasn't done anything in those 30 or more years, there is still opportunity for stuff to change inside. The most common issue is that the wheels and metal contacts oxidize, especially if they're in a damp environment. So that will prevent the electrical system from working properly. And the second most common problem is that the lubricants in these locomotives, which you know they often left the factory with 50 plus years ago, have dried out and seized the entire drive. So neither of those are big issues, but if you don't take care of them, the engine might not run, or maybe it will run, but it will run kind of crappy. So today I'm gonna to be showing you kind of how to resolve that with this engine, which I can just tell by the looks of it has been in storage for a very long period of time. So I'll take it over the track and then I'll show you what exactly to do. So here's what's happening. And this is a very common situation with an engine which has been in storage for a while. You put power in the track and uh, my controller has a current draw meter. You can see it's not pulling any current, so it's not picking up power. If I wiggle this on the track, a bit of power will get through and you can see there is a tiny bit of current draw, but for the most part, it's not going. And this is almost entirely due to the state of the wheels. And if I kept wiggling this thing around, it's possible it would get moving again because uh, it's, it's really just from sitting for so long, these things usually don't go. But what would really be best would be to take this thing apart and properly clean everything up and uh, see if we can bring it back to life. Before we get started, I just want to point something out, which is that I wouldn't recommend working on a locomotive if you don't have a lot of experience, if the engine has any sentimental value. You know, if it's just something you picked up at a flea market, you don't really have to worry. But, you know, if you're inexperienced with this and, and you break something with sentimental value, it's obviously a lot worse than something which doesn't really matter to you. So if that's the case, what I'd recommend doing is pick up a cheap locomotive for $10, which is broken, and practice on that before you get working on something that might have some meaning to someone. Anyways, we're going to uh, get the drive out. In the case of these Bachmans, it's pretty easy. Obviously, with different manufacturers, yeah, the process is going to be different. I've got tons of videos working on different locomotives, and in most cases, I disassemble the drive, so you can kind of follow those to see what to do. You know, they're not exactly a tutorial, but you can still kind of follow them, right? And uh, yeah, in, in this case, we're, we're gonna just be doing a lot of the same steps to get this thing going again, so it should, uh, should apply to most engines, even if they're a different make. So right here, we're gonna be removing the brush plates on different styles of motors. You don't always have to do this, but ultimately we're trying to get down to a part which is called the commutator, and that's where the engine basically picks up its power. This is another area where the metals can become oxidized if moisture got into the drive. So uh, I highly recommend uh, servicing this part. Plus, if the engine has been run a lot, there's likely carbon buildup on the commutator, and that's another thing you certainly want to take care of because it will extend the lifespan of the motor quite significantly if you uh, maintain it properly and the engine will run a lot better. So I would highly recommend it. Behind both those springs are the brushes. I'll try to get those out. Sometimes they'll get stuck. But in this case, we actually did manage to get them both out, so that's good. Now at this point, we'll just get a flat heads under here. And you can see this thing is full of all sorts of nasty old lubricants. This is exactly the kind of thing I was referring to earlier. That right there is the exact kind of thing you don't want to have in your locomotive's drive system. And this is another thing which is very common for locomotives, especially from the 70s and 80s. Uh, partially due to how their gearboxes were designed, but also just because back then most train sets were sold with track which rode directly on the ground. It didn't have any roadbed. So as a result, a lot of the engines which were run on carpet ended up, you know, drawing in a lot of those fibers which uh, in many cases burns out the motor and you can see right here too just how 
uh, you know, poor job the contacts are doing at picking up power. This one's not even connected anymore, so it doesn't really have much use. So right under here is the part I was referring to earlier, which is quite critical. This right here is the commutator, and in this case, this one actually looks very good. Uh, everything's quite clean. We're going to clean out the gaps and the metal surface just to be safe, but uh, often when you open these things up, they'll be a little bit more nasty. Uh, this type of motor right here is known as a pancake motor. They're very common in the older Bachmans, the lifelike locomotives, uh, Tyco locomotives, and uh, even some Lionel stuff in HO. Uh, but on a lot of other locomotives you might be working on, uh, you'll have something a lot more similar to this and it's the exact same part just laid out differently and uh, this one has a few more plates because it's a five pole versus this is a three but same concept so just clean it out the same way i'm just going to use this tool right here this is a fiberglass pencil you can pick them up on amazon and ebay for about eight dollars they're not too expensive but assuming you don't have one alternatively you could Probably use a very high grit of sandpaper. I wouldn't use anything probably lower than a thousand grit. You probably want to aim for like 2000 grit, uh, but just something that can remove all the oxidization uh, off the metal should be good, but it has to be soft because if you make this coarse, it's going to wear down your brushes and the motor is not going to turn as well. It's very important. And as always, take something like a toothpick, something softer than the metal so you don't scratch it, and just clean out these gaps and just make sure there's nothing built up in there because this can lead to a lot of problems if you don't watch it. And now we're going to focus on the gearbox. This one looks okay, but uh, you have to be careful because even, you know, just the tiniest pieces of dust and hair can get wound around them, and you can see I'm already removing a whole bunch of different stuff, so... Just keep kind of picking away at it until you've pretty much removed everything. Before we reassemble everything, we're just going to clean out the gearbox, get all these old lubricants and bits of smaller dust out. Um, I, using a q-tip on these things is okay but you have to keep a close eye on what you're working on because the little fibers of this can also get caught in the gearbox so just uh, keep that in mind you know we're trying to get all those sorts of things out of the gearbox you don't want to be adding new ones All right, so with the parts uh, mostly cleaned up, we can start reassembling this whole gearbox. I'm gonna put a little bit of oil in here. Optimally, you wanna use you know, a proper modeling lubricant. I use Labelle, but there are many other brands to choose from. As far as I know, they all kinda do the same thing, but uh, it, it is better to use a modeling lubricant. In a really cheap engine you don't care about, you might get away with using a bit of 3-in-1 oil, you know, it's certainly not recommended, but it will probably be okay. But whatever you do, just don't put a lot of it, because uh, over-lubricating an engine with any sort of oil is just not a good thing. So anyways, we'll get all that in there. Actually, I'm a step ahead here. We need to uh, reinstall this part right here. A lot of people will suggest oiling the motor bearings and uh, the one on this side is fine but i would actually advise against oiling this bearing if you do put lubricant put a very small amount because if you put too much it will get on the commutator and burn and that can ruin a motor very very quickly so it doesn't matter on this side there's no commutator to harm and now we can reinstall the screws Before we go reinstalling the wheels, I just want to show you all what you should do, which is just to clean them up. It's way easier to clean them when they're outside of the locomotive. Now, I've already cleaned this wheel, but I'll clean the other live on camera just using this fiberglass pencil. 
Again, a very high grit sandpaper will probably do a similar job, but just as long as you scrape off the oxidization. With something that's not too abrasive, it should be fine. The only thing I probably would avoid is steel wool since if it gets caught up in the motor, it can cause a lot of issues. But uh, even a scotch bright, you know, that doesn't have that metal in it, probably do a pretty good job with uh, a set of wheels like this. It might take a while, but uh, whatever gets the job done. Another important thing in these Bachmann engines, or really any engines that use contacts, is to also clean the sides because, you know, it's another contact surface. So I'll just quickly clean that up and it should be all right. Now here's something important. The contacts are obviously not looking that great, so before we do anything, we'll just quickly uh, polish them up. But also these are obviously spring-loaded so they need to apply pressure. And I don't want to bend these too much. You know, I wouldn't mess around with them like crazy, but just making sure that they're high enough to actually reach the wheel sets and apply adequate tension is a good thing. Now, in this case, this one's broken off, so we're gonna have to resolder the red wire, but uh, at least it will make proper contact now. Okay, so we got all that uh, soldered up, so I think we can just throw this back on like so, and then we'll get the brushes and other parts back in. should point out too, your springs should obviously be in good condition. If they're all compressed, that's usually a sign the motor is overheated. You can replace them and the motor might still work, but uh, it's not a great sign. So if your springs are in good condition, that's probably a good sign the motor is too. Anyways, we'll get these uh, both on here. It doesn't matter which wire goes to uh, which terminal. It will affect which direction it runs though. So if you flip these around, the engine will run the opposite direction. One thing that might matter though is uh, which of these wires goes where because um, on this Bachmann engine, I'll show you in a second here. On this Bachmann engine, you've got power coming up through this truck and this truck, but if you flip this around, it might take in power the wrong way, which will cause a short circuit. So these wheels need to be getting power on the same side. And if these wires rotate, that will cause a problem. But uh, yeah, other than that, we've basically got the drive back together, so we'll just uh, squeeze this part in. And now we'll just do the same thing we did to the rear truck to the front truck, except all we have to do now is clean the wheels. For whatever reason, Bachman decided to insulate the wheels on one side but not the other. I don't know if that has an effect just because in this case, you know, the locomotive uses contacts, so it's not like there's uh, grounds, which, you know, you see on some engines. But uh, it's just something I thought I'd note. Anyway, you can see right here, the contacts are all uh, making good contact with the wheels. Let's put some lubricant in there. Unfortunately, I broke this one, but uh, between the rest of them, I think it will be enough. So I'll throw that back on there. That's it. Now we just uh, reinstall the shell, and hopefully, provided this is all wired correctly, this engine will hopefully start up. All right, folks, moment of truth. Have we brought this locomotive back to life after many years in storage? Yes, we have. Look at that. No doubt. Look at her go. It's 
So as you can see, with just a little bit of cleaning and a little bit of lubricating, you can bring an engine like this back to life. And I find a good rule of thumb is just try to make things the way they were when they left the factory. You know, when you see a piece of metal, imagine, was it rusty or was it clean? You see a gearbox that have good lubricant in it or dry lubricant. And I find generally when you follow that rule, you can get these things going again. Uh, and if you work on something like this and you don't get it going the first time, you know, don't be ashamed. I've been working on these things for 10 plus years and I still make mistakes all the time. It's very, very normal to put something like this on the track and it won't start the first time. So do not get discouraged. But in any case, I hope you found uh, some of this helpful. And with that, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching.